Good morning and welcome to the CEFC Green Room webinar series, second in fact in our, uh, in our series on clean energy uh, issues. Uh, so firstly I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners uh, of, the, uh, of the land upon which I am based today, the Gadigal uh, people of the Eora Nation and their elders past, present and emerging. Um, so just a couple of housekeeping items uh, before we kick off. We, um, uh, you can ask questions. So we're going to have a couple of speakers here today. We'll have a bit of a panel session, chat to a couple of experts, of course, um, on the issue of large scale solar. However, you can ask questions, uh, which we'll try and address a bit later in the, uh, in the webinar. And there's a Q&A box on the screen. So feel free uh, to send us your questions. Um, there's also going to be a, uh, a short questionnaire um, at the end of the, uh, of the webinar, and we'd appreciate your feedback for future events. So as mentioned, we are here today to talk about large-scale solar, um, which, of course, is a very big issue uh, in the renewable sector had unprecedented growth um, in Australia, uh, particularly over the last five or six years. We've doubled our, our capacity um, to something uh, more, something like you know, over 2.8 gigawatts, which, which, um, which brings it, uh, large scale solar up to approximately 10% of the, uh, the makeup of renewable energy, which in turn is about 24%, depending upon uh, what time of the day and what state you're in, of course. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, of course, combined with rooftop solar, which is, which is some, uh, you know, some, you know, over two gigawatts of, of that added last year, uh, which makes up 22% of renewables uh, here in Australia. So solar, a very big theme, of course, in, in energy here in Australia. Um, but it hasn't all been... Uh, a bed of roses. Uh, you know, the, the market has slowed, particularly in the first half of, of this year, and there are some challenges. And there are challenges uh, not just around the, the COVID pandemic, but of course, around the engineering side of it and the grid. And we're going to talk about some of those today. The uh, AEMA, of course, uh, released their integrated uh, system plan for 2021, following on from the initial one in 2018, and have made some very big predictions around um, <clears throat> renewable energy over the coming 20 years. And with I think they're predicting something like 26 gigawatts of power coming into, uh, into the grid, wind, solar, uh, alongside um, other forms of firming and storage, pump storage, batteries. So a lot to happen over the coming 20 years. So that's why we are here today to discuss it all. And I have... Uh, Two experts uh, here in the uh, in the green room this morning. I've got CFC's Monique Miller, uh, one of my colleagues, um, and Monique is head of large scale solar and dispatchable renewables. Has been in and around the clean energy sector and environmental finance for some fifteen years, um, having worked for us for for a number of years and, and formerly at the Macquarie Group. Has been involved in over a gigawatt of utility scale solar deals here at the CEFC. I've also got in the green room, uh, Margarita uh, Pimentel uh, from AEMO. So fantastic to have uh, someone from the grid operator with us this morning. And uh, Margarita has recently returned to AEMO, although had worked there for eight years, uh, some only, only a few years ago. So has been in and around the en energy industry for some 20 years. So. Um, Look forward to some of the insights um, from Aimo and Margarita. Okay, so um, maybe we'll start with Margarita, and um, you know, it'd be great to uh, just give us a bit about, um, tell us a little bit about about yourself, your role um, at Aimo, and and maybe um, you know what you see as as, pro as as the big issues that that Aimo at a high level uh, is facing today. Over to you. Uh, sure. Um, so, so I guess uh, in terms of my role, uh, I look after uh, connections within um, the Victorian region of the national electricity market uh, and essentially undertake um, the network service provider role 
uh, in that connection process. Um, basically working with, with generators, uh, storage providers, uh, and, and also major loads uh, in helping them to connect to the system. Um, I guess one of the one of the key uh, some of the key things that we're we're seeing in AEMO today, uh, and some of the key things that we're dealing with today is really, to be honest, um, that rapid transition uh, from synchronous generation uh, to renewable energy, uh, particularly with the drive from uh, government uh, and 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 the support from government in actually pushing that forward, uh, and just understanding uh, what that means in the context of how our system needs might operate differently. Uh, and how we actually might need to, uh, how we might need to adapt uh, to uh, manage uh, such such large um, large projects that that are that consist of, of technologies that we we haven't really dealt with before on such a large scale. Uh, back to you, Ian. Thank you, um, and yes, look forward to exploring some of those challenges over the course of the. Of the uh, of the chat, um, Monique, um, over to you. Um, initially, I, you know, you've obviously been working in and around um, this particular uh, renewable energy asset class for a number of years. It'd be good to start to hear initially about the positive developments uh, with grid scale solar, and you know, all the, all, the, all the great things that you've seen so far. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about that. Monique, are you on mute? Yep. Thanks, Ian. <laughs> um, so I joined CFC about seven years ago. And um, at the time, it's hard to imagine now, but even the wind industry was really just starting to gain traction as a serious part of the energy mix. And the solar industry, the large-scale solar industry, was a tiny niche player, heavily supported by government grants. Um, and it's hard to think, but in that seven years, there's been this incredible transition. And what's happened is the costs of wind and solar have come down to such an extent that it's now inevitable that they're going to be a part of the energy mix going forward and, and a significant part of the new build that needs to happen as the coal generators retire. So I think um, when we look back in the day, I remember having discussions with the clean energy regulator about how Australia could possibly meet the renewable energy target. And in, in the five years since we had those discussions, we've absolutely blitzed it. And um, part of the story that the CEFC has been involved in is that we, we partnered with ARENA. Um, at that time when large-scale solar was reliant heavily on government grants, we partnered with them to try and drive a competitive round to bring down the costs in Australia. And that was really well-timed, as it turned out, because during the course of that grant program, the costs of solar roughly halved. And so we had um, a lot of learnings from those initial projects, but um, since then, utility solar has just played a significant part. And the, the discussion has really turned, as, as Margarita alluded to, it's turned from, you know, how can we so subsidize and support the renewables en en energy industry to more of a discussion about how do we how do we manage that inevitable transition towards renewables and how do we make sure that the grid can cope with that. Um, that intermittent energy mix and, and the new, but there's still a lot more that needs to be built to um, to transition to even just to, to support the the generation fleet when the, as the coal retires, regardless of climate policy or otherwise. So it's going to be a really exciting next five years, I hope as well. Thank you, um, <clears throat> and Margarita. I mean, maybe be interested to hear from you describe the last five years of grid scale solar integration. Has that been, you know, for the first two or three years relatively straightforward and it's only just been more recently that the challenges have emerged? Uh, so, so good question. Um, I guess probably one of the things that we've seen has been with the, with, with the drive um, and the funding of projects, uh, we've probably seen a lot more, a lot more developers coming into play uh, and we've seen developers with varied experience uh, so some of those developers are actually going through the process for the first the connections process for the first time uh, and they're um, and 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 we're needing to uh, we're finding that we're we're actually uh, needing to educate them through that process and and sort of walk them through that process um, I think in the context of those projects as well they're becoming much larger scale uh, 
uh, which really means that uh, in terms of in terms of connecting them into into the power system, uh, we're seeing much larger step changes, uh, and 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 that means that we need to be um, much more cognizant of, of the impact that they might have on the power system and and how we actually need to manage that impact and how we need to how, how we need to work with we need the power system to actually work with the generator basically. Um, I think probably in the, another thing that we're finding is uh, clustering of, of generation projects. And so where resources, uh, resources such as solar are prominent in particular areas. And so mm, projects will, will cluster towards those areas. Uh, and that clustering um, means that we actually need to look at projects collectively uh, to understand, um, understand how they're going to interact one with each other. Uh, and two with, with the power system and with the network itself, uh, and so um, and so that's made uh, that's probably introduced a level of complexity uh, in the connections process for us as well. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> maybe coming back to you, Monique. Um, obviously, for the last year or, or more, we've been hearing a lot about the, the very difficult challenges with building out and developing solar in the current market. It'd be good to hear uh, from you how you see those challenges, what they are, what they mean, uh, and where they, you know, how they might be addressed. Yeah, thanks, Ian. So I mentioned it's been a really exciting five years for the solar industry, but it hasn't been simple and it hasn't been easy. And um, and there's been just candidly, there's been a lot of learnings along the way. And um, I think for you know everyone in the industry, because it's so nascent, is is learning by doing. And I think that probably includes the you know the transmission authorities and trying to to just cope with the pace of change. So um, as Margarita mentioned. Um, solar projects and and to be fair wind um, have tended to go towards where the resource is highest and so what that means is that they have tended to cluster around the sunniest parts of the country where land is cheap and where there's some access to connection and um, cities don't tend to be built where there is uh, where there's constant sunshine and no rain throughout the year so what that means is you have a grid that was built for um, coal-fired power stations near the cities delivering along skinny transmissions lines out to the farms and now you've got significant amounts of power coming the other way and um, and what that the learnings that have been happening on the ground I guess is um, number one that uh, the construction of solar farms is 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 can be challenging so there are it's a specialist skill set and there's been a fair amount of learnings from the builders along the way in fact, um, Akistica did a really, uh, Akistica, the technical advisors, did an interesting piece of work for ARENA, our cousin grants agency, and the CFC around the learnings of the first solar projects, the construction phase of those projects that we financed together. And I think some of the learnings, just to call them out, was um, number one, I mentioned capital costs dropped significantly, so capital costs halved, and that was. Um, driven by a number of things. It was cost reductions in manufacturing of panels in, in China. And it was also that the builders that were coming in from offshore had worked out how to be more efficient in the process. And that was reducing the number of man hours, I guess, the labor costs, which in Australia can be significant. Um, but it's fair to say that notwithstanding those efficiencies, that the construction period was actually significantly longer than expected for those first projects. I think um, for the arena projects and, and our projects just in that year afterwards, um, projects reached practical completion some 38 weeks after the original expected date at financial close. So that's a significant delay. And it's fair to say that a lot of the costs of that delay were built were borne by the builders of those projects. And that caused a, a fair bit of pain in, in that industry. Um, the connection process as well, I think as for the various reasons that Margarita has set out, the connection process was challenging and took people longer to, to work through than they had expected. And that can be because people were doing it for the first time, but it can also be because the grid is changing so quickly where in that cluster where that project is based that um, what might have been assumed when you first started looking at the connection for that project is, is no longer valid by the time you get to actually connecting it into the grid because of what's happened around it. So the connection process, the delay was about 28 weeks on, on average, I think. Um, so I guess 
what we take away from that, it's, it's very difficult to work out where that risk should sit when you're funding a, a solar project because it's not really appropriate that the connection, pay, the connection risk should sit with the APC contractor, the builder, although that's traditionally where it has sat. But it's also not really appropriate for it to sit in, in an individual project, which is mostly a special purpose vehicle where there's no kind of additional funding to, to accommodate that cost. So I think the lessons for investors have really been, you know, really understand what your construction timing is, what your risk is, and, and what your connection timing and risk, and, and be aware that that time frame can move. And when you're bringing together the various pieces of your project, be aware that they will need to fit together and, and to be able to accommodate some delays. Yeah. Um, you know, obviously has been, has been a major issue. And maybe if you could also tell us a bit about how COVID's been impacting the sector over the last three or four months. If you, you kind of have a feel for the, the impact of the pandemic. Yeah, thanks, Ian. It's obviously very topical. So um, as the COVID um, regulations and, and announcements started to come into effect, there was a flurry of um, force majeure notices from contractors and um, from projects to off-takers, uh, basically saying, there is this event, we don't really know what it means, but it could cause a delay and it is outside of our control. So there was that whole fluster and, and we were a bit concerned that there could be you know, significant disputes between projects, the various stakeholders and projects. But in fact, the way that it's played out is there, there was a little bit of delay in, um, in shipments for products manufactured in, in China and Italy particularly. Um, most of the shutdowns have still been able to accommodate construction workers on site. So the build hasn't necessarily been significantly delayed, although obviously they do need to put in place safety measures and um, and that might be different shifts and different, um, there might be some additional cost to, to bearing that. Uh, but what we have seen play out is in the economic markets generally, um, obviously there was a lot of uncertainty when um, as to what COVID meant for the local and the global economy and, and particularly the cost of funding for investors in, in those markets. Um, so I think CFC has been, you know, actively involved in the market to see whether our support is needed to, to um, help shepherd projects through this phase where there was some uncertainty. I think it's fair to say that now that's settling a little bit and the banks now better understand what the cost of funding is and there's more certainty, I guess, from equity investors. And so we're still seeing a lot of appetite in the market for renewable energy projects, which you know are, are significantly de-risked. And so that's that's been really, we still feel like the market is fairly healthy, notwithstanding the challenges that COVID's presenting. Yeah, thank you. Um, <clears throat> Margarita, we've, we've heard about some of those um, you know, connection um, and grid related challenges in terms of the projects that Monique was referring to. Do, how is AEMO looking to, to kind of address those? And is the 2020 ISP, is, is, is that really go a long way to, to sort of addressing the structural problem that we've got around the uptake, rapid uptake of distributed uh, generation like solar? With uh, with a grid that wasn't really built for it. Uh, so so in terms of the twenty twenty ISP, I think um, the the ISP provides us with with the ability to actually uh, anticipate how much penetration we can actually expect. Uh, so if we're talking about, I guess if we're talking about um, Victoria, uh, we're looking at something like. Uh, an additional 6,000 megawatts of wind, utility, solar, and dispatchable storage, um, and 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 we're looking at that as as Monique alluded to before. Um, we're really looking at that in the context of uh, supplementing uh, generation that is that is signalled to retire uh, in in future years. Uh, and I guess um, one of the key things that that's that's really brought to mind is is uh, you've got you've got all of that generation. Uh, it's it's essentially uh, non-dispatchable generation, which means that uh, that that you need once it's generating, you need somewhere to be able to either store it or to transfer transport it to, uh, and so that's really brought in the focus on storage, uh, and it's also brought in the focus on uh, interconnection as well. Uh, I guess in terms of um, I guess in terms of other things that we're looking to do is really looking at 
uh, system strength and, and understanding uh, the impact of uh, renewable generation on system strength within um, within the broader power system and just trying to identify locational issues, uh, particularly particularly where we see large projects clustering um, uh, and and, and beginning, to, um, beginning to potentially create uh, issues with, with system voltages and system strength. Um, yeah. I think in terms of, oh, sorry, go on. No, no, you, you keep going. I, I've got a question at the end of this. Cool. Um, I think in terms of, of that level of penetration, uh, there's, also, um, there's also a question around uh, developers and actually how we help them through the process uh, and particularly in terms of providing greater visibility and transparency of what the process involves uh, and what, our key, what are our key, key considerations in that process uh, and what does that mean in terms of the information uh, that, they, that they need to be able to provide us uh, so, that, so that we can, we can progress those connections uh, in, a, in a timely manner. Uh, and as, as Monique quite correctly uh, identified earlier, um, connection processes have been quite long uh, and, 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 um, and, and at times protracted. Uh, and, and when you think about that and you think about the, the, the scale of the projects that are being built, um, uh, there's, there's also the, the fact that the system is changing so rapidly uh, that, um, that we need to assess those projects uh, at, at, at intermittent periods within, within the connection process itself. Uh, and that can sometimes be frustrating for generation proponents, uh, and um, and it's really just about uh, having generation proponents understand the, why we need to do that, uh, and also um, taking them along on the journey and giving them visibility of what we're doing uh, and the results that we're coming out with, and and what that means in the context and how it impacts their project. Yeah, um, and and th thank you. The the, I guess another significant part of the ISP is the identification of renewable energy zones, um, where you know we were talking about trying to get um, tap into the, you know the, the, the best resource um, and combined with a sensible places to connect to the grid where load is is nearby to to address some of these. Um, you know, curtailment and marginal loss factor issues. Um, I'd be interested to hear your thoughts on you know the plans around renewable energy zones and and how we um, and maybe it's a combination and Monique will have some thoughts on this as well as is, is you know how we get developers in the market and grid grid owners in some cases state owned in some cases um, privatised uh, to fall in line with the the blueprint that. That is a renewable energy zone, and, and you know how we kind of take it from aspirational plan to uh, to actually to be implemented. Um, maybe if you could talk a little bit about that, Margarita. Sure. Um, so, so I guess one of the key things uh, that we're we're looking to do as 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 part of that um, part of part of looking at um, at renewable energy zones is really uh, just. Just looking at where where connections are clustering, um, and where they're clustering um, near either proposed uh, proposed terminal stations or or existing terminal stations, uh, and actually and actually looking at how we can bring those proponents together uh, to have a discussion around um, have a discussion around uh, collectively creating uh, a renewable energy zone and and looking at the practicalities of that. So I guess when I when I talk about the qualities, I guess I think I'm thinking about things like uh, concerns about um, being the first mover, um, concerns about funding funding assets that others will utilise, um, and how do you how do you share the costs associated with that? Um, how do you how do you share the costs and the timing around um, land use planning, uh, and how does all of that work? Uh, and so so from our perspective, it's about one identifying those projects, uh, two bringing them together. To actually start the conversation around renewable energy zones and understand the appetite uh, to to actually develop a renewable energy zone, um, and and three then starting to actually develop uh, the practical framework uh, to be able to implement um, that process and, and and start moving forward. Yeah. Um, 
And maybe uh, you know over to Monique for a few thoughts on there about what it would what it would take for uh, solar grid scale solar developers to you know the right signals um, for for them to start building around these renewable energy zones while there's potentially a uh, you know there's a wait for the um, for the grid to be built out to that particular site. What's what's it going to take to stimulate that sort of investment? Yeah, thanks, Ian. I think it's an interesting question. I think um, in the past, the model has always been individual developers racing for their own um, connection. And and sometimes what's happened, as Margarita has alluded to, is that there's been basically um, different projects racing to financial close and connection in the same region, not aware that the others are involved and not aware that they're moving to close. And so you can imagine the forecasts that each project is getting on you know what their connection will look like and what their loss factors will be turn out to be wrong when when right next door is built a similar size project and and um so i think now that we have more developers that are going through their second third fourth fifth project i think they're starting to value that some transparency in terms of what's happening in the grid around and actually we we have seen some really good examples of cooperation between developers to address some of the challenges. You know, um, the curtailment in, in Northwest Victoria, particularly, we saw some cooperation between developers to try and get the, the best overall outcome, even if that required a bit of horse trading between projects. So I think um, as, as d there's more developers with more projects, I think they'll see the benefit of, you know, working together to some extent. And then on the flip side, um, there perhaps is a role that the CEFC can play. And um, as you know, Ian, we've taken a few of our, or quite a few of our really kind of gun originators on the investment team and allowed them to spend some time really thinking about the tough issues like renewable energy zones and, um, you know, significant transmission upgrades, things that might be, you know, a few years down the horizon, but that really require a lot of thought and really require them to be built in a way that's investable. And so, um, I think it's fair to say that some of our risk appetite that we might have deployed on on large scale solar in the beginning to help accelerate the pace of that market, I think we're looking at trying to see what we can do on the transmission renewable energy zone and the storage space really to to accelerate the pace of that change as well. So hopefully, you know, CFC might be a somewhat neutral party that can try and facilitate those renewable energy zones as, as an investor alongside other investors, obviously, in the market. Yeah, no, no, absolutely. Um, and one of the one of the issues that projects we're seeing um, is um, being required to to address some of these system security and um, firming issues. And maybe it's a, another question for Margarita. Just coming back to um, some of the more specific challenges that the grids had, obviously in Northwest Victoria, and then more recently in the, the announcement in North Queensland, where MLF numbers were very high and all curtailment was, was being imposed. Um, do, do you, um, Margarita, it, it, do you know, um, is there was particularly with the recent announcement of Queensland, is, is this a case of, um, is, there, is there a need of a short-term fix to um, things like synchronous um, condensers need to be um, uh, introduced into those parts of the grid to address that? H how do we avoid these, um, I guess, these, these kind of shocks to, uh, to the system, particularly around containment and MLFs in some of these, these locations? Yeah, so that's a that's a really good question. Um, I guess I guess one of the things that we've been quite conscious of is is that uh, is that level of surprise or shock um, when when we when we encounter um, particularly um, system strength issues more recently uh, when we've encountered those uh, and and just trying to race to to catch up to catch up to those issues and and be able to actually. Uh, be able to to develop solutions around around those issues, but but almost in the sense of being in catch up mode. Uh, and so one of the things we've actually started to do uh, is um, is is look forward further. Uh, and and the idea of that is actually um, beginning to anticipate the impact of uh, of, of renewables connections um, on system strength issues and trying to identify those system strength issues early. Uh, and, and and the whole idea of that is about being able to provide early advice uh, to to investors and developers um, around uh, particular locations um, that um, 
that they might be considering uh, for the connection of, of, of large scale projects uh, and just trying to give them all the information possible for them to be able to write around the size of their project, the location of their project, the connection arrangements associated with their project. Um, I think probably the other thing that we're trying to do is actually work with generators um, to address existing issues uh, around system strength. Um, part of that is around uh, actually uh, looking at um, utilising assets that, that generators are installing and utilising the spare capacity uh, to be able to provide system strength services. Uh, and, um, and a recent example of that is, is what's happening in West Victoria, uh, where we're working in particular with two generation projects to be able to facilitate those services. Um, I think uh, the, I guess the other thing um, to probably say here is that we're working with network service providers. Uh, and so uh, trying to trying to work with network service providers to uh, identify solutions to system strength problems uh, and also provide early advice to, to generators, um, but also help generators through the problem as well. Uh, and just make sure that they're fully informed as 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 that resolution, um, as that sort of problem solving is happening, and that they're fully involved in that problem solving process as well. Yeah, thank you. Um, we're going to now go to some of the questions that are that are coming through from uh, from our audience. Um, actually, one one that I, I is kind of a more an anonymous one, but I'm going to throw it to Monique is. Uh, the Big Sun Cable Project, the $22 billion uh, uh, solar project in um, potentially in, in northern Australia, which would ship power across Indonesia to Singapore, has just been uh, announced by the federal government as a or given major project status. Um, I think it's something like uh, 10 gigawatts. Um, do we think that is a real project or not, Monique, any thoughts? Um, oh, my, my, my thought is that um, Australia as a country has the most incredible wind and solar resources and, you know, we absolutely should be looking down the track at being a, a net energy exporter, um, particularly to countries like Indonesia and Singapore who don't have the same land available for um for renewables generation. Uh, I think there's some very serious investors in that project who are obviously looking very carefully at it. So I think we've got Mike Cannon-Brooks and um, Twiggy Forrest in there looking at how, how you can get it up. I imagine, you know, if I put my project finance hat on, there's a lot of things that need to be, um, to, to fall into line before that project ultimately can, can deliver power out to Southeast Asia. And there's a lot of, you know, um, I guess bankability considerations that you'd need to to get to to get the level of investors that you would need to build a project that size comfortable with the risks. But um, on the face of it, it's it's an amazing opportunity, and I think it's it's something that you know my colleagues in the Clean Futures team that I mentioned before, who are looking at projects over the horizon um, and opportunities. I, I'm sure they'll be very you know keeping a close track of that um, in in the coming years. No, no doubt. No, very exciting. Uh, potential project. Okay, I've got a question from First State Super, and I'm going to throw this to Margarita. Uh, is rooftop solar a threat to large scale solar? And does rooftop solar need to be regulated? Any thoughts there? Oh, good question. Um, so, so, in the context of whether it's a, a threat to scale solar, um, so certainly uh, rooftop solar uh, can. can uh, if, if there's enough of it that, are, that is actually exported uh, from the site, um, yes, that, that flow into the transmission system, which can mean uh, that it may compete uh, with transmission level solar. Um, but by the same token, I think we're probably talking about, um, we're probably, we're talking about very large scale solar projects at the transmission level. And so, um, so we're going to see quite a lot of, um, there's going to be quite a lot of, of, of solar production uh, at the tra transmission level. So I would say that in of posing a major threat, um, I, I'm not so sure that it poses a major threat at scale solar. Um, I think probably the other thing that I would say uh, in terms of whether or not uh, distributed energy or, or 
or rooftop solar needs to be regulated. Uh, I think the, um, what we're looking for is uh, to have visibility of that of that rooftop solar and and have an understanding and uh, the ability to actually monitor the behaviour of that rooftop solar. And all that allows us to do is actually predict um, how that solar is going to behave uh, during the day and what that means in the context of how we need to operate the system uh, to be able to work with that solar production. Um, uh, and and so from from that perspective, uh, we and from the perspective of predictability, we probably need some consistency uh, in terms of the standards that are applied to the solar that's installed, how that solar um, operates throughout the day. Um, but it, but essentially, I think what we're really what we're really wanting to do there also is um, actually uh, leverage that solar and, and sort of maximise the value that we can get out of that solar. Uh, and in doing that, um, what we're probably looking to do at the moment is actually uh, pilot, um, pilot uh, look at how we can actually uh, extract market services uh, from that solar to uh, really be able to support the system. Uh, so, so once again, um, looking at how we can actually utilise existing assets um, from from generation uh, to be able to actually help support the, support the power system in this transition. I might, I yeah. might just add something from the investor, investor's perspective as well, Ian. So um, yeah. although it doesn't, I guess, compete from a in a technical way, um, roof, uh, utility solar, when they're looking at the business case for that, um, it's driven on, you know, how much power you're going to generate during the hours when the sun is shining and how much demand is there um, from homes in the cities, basically, for, for that power. And so to the extent that you have... Um, panels on roofs generating power at exactly the same time that you're trying to deliver it to them from solar projects out in rural areas. It, it eats into the business case, so it you know cannibalises the um, the the market price, which is a good outcome for consumers. We've seen you know market price forecasts come down a lot, um, particularly during the, the sun, sunny hours of the day, and and that's you know great news for consumers, but obviously it's it's um, painful for the incumbent investors in in solar projects who are seeing the demand for their product, I guess, being being eaten away. And so Margarita mentioned, you know, storage and, and how that might be used to uh, shift um, power from the sunny hours to the to the evening hours um, then or the early morning hours. I think that'll be a really important thing to watch in, in the coming years because that that removes some of that uh, competitive aspect, I guess, of um, of competing for the same demand. Yeah, no, no, absolutely the ever deepening duck curve. Um, question for Margarita, I think again, from um, Bruce Miller at Advisian. In order to address system strength issues, can we gain, uh, sorry, can we gain access to the modeling used by AEMO and TNSP, so um, transmission network service providers, to independently assess the technical issues? Is, is AEMO that transparent? Ah, so that's a that's another good question. Um, look, it's something that we're looking into uh, in terms of how we're to do that. Um, the the modelling that we undertake actually uh, includes um, a lot of uh, confidential information around specific projects, um, and 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 there's some very specific information in there. Uh, and so and so, what we're really looking to do is is see how we might be able to uh, to to. to um, D, D, what am I trying to say here? To, to, to actually mask that. Thank you. D I yeah. to mask that confidential information so that that way um, we're actually able to provide those system studies out to the broader to the broader industry uh, so that they can undertake their own assessments and in fact um, so that they can undertake their own their connection and prepare themselves uh, for prepare better for what they might need to do and how they might need to build their project. Uh, in order to um, in order to minimise uh, any impact on on, on the network uh, that, that their project might have. Yeah. Um, another question. Thank you. Another question from uh, from William Blomfield at DFAT. Um, he was asking about other countries and regions are no doubt experiencing similar challenges in integrating large-scale solar. How does AEMO and the CFC engage internationally to share best practice and key learnings? Well, it's interesting. I might make a few comments and then um, hand it over to the panel. But um, 
it, you know, Australia is is really um, you know, almost unlike any other market with 2.3 million households with rooftop solar um, and just an extraordinarily uh, long, skinny grid with uh, fantastic uh, solar resource. So we're probably uh, at the pointy end of some of these issues. And I noticed uh, Audrey Zebelman in um, her preface to the um, to the ISP describes the Australian experience as the world's fastest energy transition. So there's certainly a lot to be shared uh, outward, and I, you know, m and maybe the Californians and others have things to uh, that that we can learn from. Um, Margarita, do, do you tend to to stay in touch with your equivalents internationally? Uh, so, so look, we're on a so AEMO is on a number of um, international working groups, uh, and and really are the. The incentive around that is one to be able to share our experiences, but two also to understand uh, advice from those those entities internationally who are who are working through the same issues, um, or or who may just have um, may may just have a, a certain expertise uh, that we're not necessarily tapping into. Uh, uh, so uh, so yeah, certainly um, there's a number of. Uh, AEMO representatives who are engaging um, with their with their counterparts internationally uh, to be able to actually um, leverage that experience and, and and bring that experience into Australia. Uh, and I guess the other thing is is around us actually sharing our own experiences and and sort of talking through how we've how we've navigated those challenges and um, the mistakes we've made and and and, and the things that have have gone well. Thank you. Um, last question, um, possibly from um, from the from the list. Oh, we might have time for for a couple. Uh, Daniel Baird from the University of Melbourne has asked, "Why can't consumers with behind the meter generation, such as rooftop solar and batteries, access floating market prices for exported load instead of being stuck with the fixed feed-in tariff?" Any thoughts on that, Monique? Can people do that? Uh, I, I think generally, so my expertise is kind of on the transmission side, but I think generally you are stuck, I understand, with the, the uh, standard retail tariff that your retailer that is responsible for your connection will give you for the exported tariff. I'm not sure whether there's a technical reason for that or whether it's a, a market power reason. I'm not sure whether Margarita might have um, some more thoughts on you know, that, that interplay and allowing consumers access to the, to the wholesale market. Yeah, so, um, so look, one thing that um, AMO is intensively looking at at the moment uh, is how we can actually facilitate a distribution level market and what that, what that looks like um, and, uh, and, and what that means in the context of how of the changes that might be needed in the distribution network as well uh, in terms of uh, additional monitoring and, 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 and more, uh, more proactive management of the system. Uh, as well at the distribution level. Uh, so that's certainly something that we're doing quite a lot of work on um, in exploring and we're working with a number of um, distribution network service providers across the NEM uh, to, to sort of try to put together a model for how we can do that. I guess just yeah. adding to that something um, around the interface of you know consumers of power with the transmission network. I think we haven't really we've spoken a lot about the generation side. We haven't spoken at all about the demand side management side. And obviously, the more um, interplay you can get real time between, for example, when there's the sun's not shining, the wind's not blowing, but there's you know significant price spikes. Is there something that can happen on the distribution side where um, you know uh, non-critical uh, systems can be switched off. So, for example, down the track, will householders take $100 to switch off their air, condi air conditioner during a really peak time when the grid is struggling to cope with the level of demand? And I think um, something that our innovation fund, which is basically our venture capital part of CFC, is looking at is, is really, you know, how do you facilitate that active participation in the market, both from, you know, significant power users like um, uh, like utility and um, manufacturing, and but also you know down to the household level, like can you really get that interplay with households responding to price signals in in real time? I think it's a really interesting movement. Once you do get a more of a supply demand balance, and they're both more 
um, more adaptable, then that's, that's a good outcome. Yeah, absolutely. And look, there are a lot of uh, you know, new, interesting technology-driven companies that are operating in that space. Um, I think there's a there's a retailer um, called Amber that, that offers wholesale power prices for users and and household distributors of power. So there are there are players uh, emerging in, in in this sector that look at um, innovative ways of accessing both power and pricing. Uh, and, and, and changing the way things are currently operating. We've run out of time. Uh, that was fantastic. I want to thank Monique and Margarita. Thank you very much for your thoughts today. Um, thank you, everyone, who, uh, who dialed in. Uh, terrific. Well, I think we had a fantastic attendance. Uh, it's been an absolute pleasure. And we look forward to seeing you um, at the next CEFC Green Room. Thanks very much. Thanks, Dan. Thank you.